Alrighty, guys, the session is being recorded. Um, real quick, again, I'm not claiming any of this information that I'm using as my own intellectual property. It has been made available to you guys uh, by Professor Garcia, Chapter 12, Chapter 13, PowerPoint. That's basically the main bulk of what I'm using. Um, share application screen, okay. Share. Okay, you guys can see me, cool. If you have any questions, you already know, send me a text or here, or you can speak up, whatever you want, and we can get started. Okay, so this is chapter 12, and the chapter 13 PowerPoint is right here. So let's go over this exam review. Alrighty, so what is, what is the overall function of the nervous tissue? So the nervous system is the master controlling communicating system of the body. It has three functions. Sensory input, which basically, basically means that you're receiving information from the outside and you're translating it um, to your brain. So let's say, for example, if you see a pretty picture, like you seeing that pretty picture, like you're thinking, okay, I'm looking at a picture and then you're making the decision whether or not you like it, whether or not you take notice in the colors, the texture. Um, integration, which basically is the interpretation of the sensory input and the motor output. So responses to stimuli by activation of effector organs. So for example, if you see a really pretty picture and that makes you want to scream. So that's, that would be your motor output because it is the output. Okay, so CNS and PNS, what are the components and function of the CNS? So the CNS is a central nervous system. It consists of the brain um, and the spinal cord. It receives and processes the sensory input and decides what should be done at each moment and sends motor commands to the effectors. That's your CNS. Uh, the PNS is the peripheral nervous system. It's all, it's, it is all the nerves the nervous system except the brain and the spinal cord so the cns is just the brain and the spinal cord the peripheral is literally everything else that you see on the outside um it delivers sensory information to the cns and carries motor commands from the cns to the periphery so again so if you touch something that's hot this will send a signal back to your spinal cord which will jump back into your brain saying hey it's hot move your hands and then it'll Consequently, move down and make you move your hand. Okay, so what is the somatic nervous system and what is the autonomic nervous system? So within your CNS and PNS, this is like the basic overall umbrella um, category, then we start breaking it down. So we don't break down the CNS because it's just your brain and spinal cord, but we can break down the PNS. Okay, so here within the PNS, you have your sensory and your motor division. Um, within the PNS, you have your sensory, which basically is the one that carries the information afferently. So uh, what that means basically is that the information is being carried to your central nervous system. And it carries information. And the motor division, or the efferent division is the one that carries the information from the CNS to the, to, you know, the organs or muscles or whatever. Um, so that's those two divisions. And then within this one, what is the somatic and autonomic nervous system? Within the motor division, we have the autonomic and then the nervous, I mean, sorry, the autonomic and then the somatic, which basically is the one that controls um, like everything that is your viscera um, and things that you don't have to think about. So like respiration, uh, your heartbeat, uh, digestion, peristalsis, all that stuff is controlled by your autonomic nervous system. Uh, auto means like automatic, so that's a good way to remember that. And somatic um, carries voluntary muscle control. So here it says voluntary, involuntary. That's also like two keywords to use there. So autonomic, involuntary, somatic, voluntary. Um, so yeah, so that's within your motor division of your PNS, which is right here. 
Okay. Um, what is the difference between the two? The main, main, main difference is that, again, one carries out involuntary actions, such as breathing um, and heart rate, or the muscle contraction within your heart. And the other um, carries out things that you actively control. So like if you want to stretch and you want to stretch your arms, that's your somatic nervous system going into play because you are telling your arms to stretch out. So yeah. Okay, now let's talk about the neuron. What are the layers of neuron? Wait, before I continue, is everyone with me? Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> Let me know if I'm going too fast. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome, thanks for the feedback, guys. What are the layers of the neuron? Okay, so the layers. This is a very general question. I'm assuming the question is basically like we have the axolemma which is basically the, plas the plasma membrane of the neuron, uh, sorry, of the axon. You have your cell body. Um, you have the dendrites. Um, you have the nasal bodies, which are, are, are here on the inside, the nucleus. And uh, you have the neurolemma, which is the outer layer of the plasma membrane of the Schwann cells, so of these big guys that... Um, basically cover the neuron. And these guys are really cool. We're gonna get into that real quick. Okay, so that leads me to my next to the next question. What is myelination and how does it affect the speed of conduction? So these guys, these Schwann cells, produce uh, myelin sheets. So think of these myelin sheets like like a really flexible um, cast. So when someone breaks their arm, they put their arm in a cast so that they don't move, right? So let's think of a very flexible cast that allows you to move your arm, but it's still covered. It's still wrapped in that plaster. And what these guys do basically is that they insulate it. So they're keeping it nice and warm, just as how you would feel like an intense amount of heat coming from the plaster in the cast because it's not, it doesn't breathe, right? And ultimately what these guys do is that it helps the conduction of the nerve impulse. So this is where we have Ohm's law here. And he gets into physics, which is really funny, I think. Um, so myelination, how does it affect the speed of conduction? So myelination is just the wrapping of the myelin sheet around the axon. How does it affect the speed of conduction? It aids in the speed of conduction. Um, so resistance for Ohm's law, I don't, okay, let's see, let's Google that real quick, just to have a very accurate definition, resistance Ohm's law. Okay, what does it say here? Ohm's law states that the voltage or potential difference between two points is directly proportional to the current or electricity passing through that, so V equals I R. Okay, so the voltage, so the amount of electricity that is being carried is to the, what is it, to the electricity, is equal to, is directly proportional to, to the, oh, to the current and the resistance of the circuit. So the less resistance you have, the easier the voltage can be passed, propagated through here. That's essentially what it's saying. So here we're creating the least amount of resistance in order to properly, you know, send that message down the axon to the end of it, assuming that it's either connecting to another um, cell body, to another um, neuron, or it's connecting to an effector muscle. Um, okay, what is non-myelination and how does it affect the speed of conduction? So Non-myelination is basically when you have a neuron that doesn't have any of these guys on top of it, any Schwann cells, um, and as a result, if you don't have the insulation, you're going to have that um, message, that electricity that is being propelled through, that voltage, it's not going to be able to move as fast as you would like it to. 
So let's think of a good way of thinking of this is if the myelination produces is basically an insulator. So if you're boiling water, you cover the top of the pot so that the water boils faster because it's keeping all that energy within that, that system. That would be myelination. And uh, non-myelination would be the opposite. You're leaving that pot open and out in the air. So you're losing that, that initial heat that would aid in the boiling of the water. It would make it slower. It would take more time for the water to boil as a result. Um, okay, what are the two types of conduction? You have saltator conduction. And, oh, I don't think I have it here. Let's see. Two types of neural conduction. Okay, we're gonna skip that one. We can go back to it. <laughs> um, okay, oh, saltatory conduction basically means that it's jumping from node to node. Like saltatory, like jump. That means, saltar means a jump in Spanish. So that's a good way to remember that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so what is a unipolar, multipolar, and bipolar neuron? Basically, neurons have, um, different branches depending on their location so a unipolar neuron is basically a neuron that has uh, dendrites its axon the cell body and the axon and the synaptic synaptic terminals um, all spread out unlike this one that we're used to um, it's found in the PNS because basically what it's doing is it's sending that signal. Oh, question. Isn't the two types of continuous and saltatory? Perfect. Thank you, Dariana. Yes, continuous and saltatory. Um, assuming that you don't have any myelination on the. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that you don't have any myelination on the axon, it would be continuous. If you have myelination on that axon, then it would be saltatory because it would jump from node to node, which makes sense. Okay, awesome. Glad we got that one covered. So unipolar neuron, again, is, um, is basically this, but kind of stretched out. Um, it has a receiving end and then, um, uh, I guess, exiting end or shipping end. Um, and these guys are usually found in the PNS because these are sending these signals way down from the brain or from the spinal cord to the effector muscle. Sometimes it could be even in um, to your arms. So however long it takes from your spinal cord to reach the, your, the tip of your finger. So these guys are pretty long. Um, multipolar neuron basically means that you have multiple sections in which the information can be sent in through. So here there's one reception center. Here there are, in this picture, one, two, three, four, you know, big branches, and then you have all these little branches. Um, same idea. It has its body, the axon, and the synaptic terminals where, you know, the information gets, uh, exits with the neurotransmitters. Um, what else? Uh, it's located in the CNS, the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord, uh, and the primary motor cortex of the brain and ultimately a bipolar neuron so bipolar so these guys are special because they're for your special senses <clears throat> they're known to relay information about sight smell hearing um, from receptor cells to other neurons so these guys are usually found with special senses so associate these guys with special senses and bipolar basically means that it has two receiving ends, which is what we're seeing here. Um, and again, it has a cell body, the axon, the synaptic terminals, and it's not as long as this guy. So that's pretty much it. Okay, moving on. What is a sensory neuron? What is an interneuron? Okay, so a sensory neuron is basically, um, they carry information towards the central nervous system. So everything that is being received from the outside um, being sent back to the brain. 
these these are the things that the sensory neurons do. They monitor the outside world and our position within it. And then they monitor, like, so for the somatic and the autonomic, the difference between the two would be somatic, they monitor the outside, and then the visceral or the autonomic sensory neurons monitor your viscera, so your organs, and make sure that everything is up to date. Everything's like running on the latest software. Um, and the interneurons, they carry, so these guys are the in between, so inter means in like between. The interneurons carry impulses uh, between the sensory and the motor neurons located at the CNS. So they are the bridge between the two. Um, what are Schwann cells and what are oligodendrocytes? So going back to this picture right here, Schwann cells are these guys. They produce myelin sheets, and they're usually found in the neurons that are in your PNS, in your peripheral nervous system. Um, again, they myelinate the the axons, so they help sending they help send the the action potential down the axon at a very rapid pace. Um, oligodendrocytes, on the other hand, are found in your CNS, so they are basically the insulators of the neurons that are found within the the brain or the spinal cord. So. They basically do the same thing, it's just location. Schwann cell, PNS, oligodendrocyte, CNS. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, you see, PNS, Schwann cells. Cool. Um, okay, brain, spinal cord, corresponding structures. Okay, so what are the structures that protect the brain and the spinal cord? So they're the meninges. This picture I got uh, from Google. Um, really easy search away. So we have literally a cross section of what we have here. So we have the scalp, the skull, the periosteal dura mater. So basically, peri means around osteal bone dura mater. So then you have the dura mater that basically touches the skull. Then you have the meningeal dura mater, which is the dura mater that is the one that touches your meninges. But the dura mater, this is the same dura mater. So that's one of the um, the outermost meningi. Then you have your arachnoid matter, which is this white sheet right here. Your subarachnoid space, which is basically an empty space where you find uh, the blood vessels. Your pia matter, which is the very thin layer that covers your brain, and ultimately your cerebral cortex, which is this dude right here. It's your brain. Um, so yeah, so those are the structures, and the meninges are your dura, your arachnoid, your subarachnoid, and your Okay, so CSF, what's the function of CSF? Cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it cushions the neural structures, so it creates, like, your brain is basically floating in a very contained vat of CSF. It's not, like, touching your skull to make sure that in case you hit yourself or something, it cushions it. Like, when you have a concussion, basically what happens is that your brain touches your skull. And that's why people, you know, get nauseous or whatever, because it's it was moved out of place. Um, it supports the brain um, in transporting nutrients, chemical messengers, and waste products. So the CSF basically um, flows through your brain and your spinal cord. It then empties out in one of your, um, your veins in your brain within the skull. Um, and it gets recycled back into your into your blood to be able to clean through it, and then you produce more CSF um, by your epin, 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 ependymal cells. Um, let me look it up because I want to be able to ependymal. Yes, exactly. I don't know if I'm saying it right though. Anyways, what produces CSF and where is it found? Your choroid plexus, basically, which is lined with ep ep ependymal cells, and it's found in the four ventricles within your brain. Um, that's pretty much it. This this little picture gets um, into it a little bit more in depth. Um, but yeah, ultimately, your ependymal cells, ependymal cells. Um, produce CSF, they line your four ventricles, 
um, and they are part of the choroid plexus. What is the most abundant glial cell of the CNS and what is its function? The astrocytes are the most abundant cell in your CNS and they are involved in the blood-brain barrier. Basically, that's the barrier that um, <clears throat> These are like that blood brain barrier is the thing that keeps a lot of people that um, OD or get close to ODing alive. Um, that blood brain barrier is very highly selective for um, nutrients and ions that are able to come in and out to the brain. Kind of think of it like the bouncer at the VIP section of a club, I guess. Um, very highly selective, only lets people that look like celebrities in. That's how um, selective that blood-brain barrier is to certain ions, chemicals, and nutrients. Okay, so what is the difference between columns, tracks, horns, and cortex? This question cost me a little bit of trouble because it's very general, so I feel for you guys. Um... So, okay, so a tract is a grouping of nerves that all originate and end at the same place, ascending or descending. So a good way of thinking about it would be this. So it would either be right here, right here, right here, or here. This is all like the same grouping of nerves that are either ascending and descending, and they all originate at the same place. Um, tracts can either be afferent or efferent. And the same for columns. So a column is just basically a grouping of nerves that are either that all originate from the same place. They can be ascending or descending. Ascending basically means that they carry sensory information towards the brain. And descending means that they carry motor commands from the brain to the spinal cord. Um, so yeah, so tracks and columns are just a grouping of nerves. Um, they can both be part of the ascending or the descending depending on their location so based on the location as you can see here closer to the to the to the gray matter you have descending out like further away you have ascending um the horns again can be ascending or descending and we have this here so the anterior white horn the gray horn right here sends um information to the effector muscle so that would be descending and the posterior gray horn here sends information to the sensory receptor so that would be ascending because it's sending it back to the brain um, please go over this part of it in depth in detail because it can be very confusing okay so when you study um, just make sure that you know this like the back of your hand because I know that I have trouble with it and this is not the first time that I go over this. So I can't imagine you guys. So please take that into account and dedicate at least 20 minutes to really understanding what this means and how these guys um, function. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, so where are the enlargements of the spinal cord and why do they form? So we have enlargements of the spinal cord at C1, well, this is which is your medulla, the cervical enlargement that is from C4 to T2, and your lumbar enlargement from L2 to S3. So, ultimately, what you need to know is that you have um, spinal cord enlargements, and the reason for that is so the, the nerves can like reach your limbs. That's why we have it. So if we think about it from C4 to T2, what do you have there? Your arms, right? If you extend your arms, wingspan, you, you would, some people measure six feet across, the, the people that are really, really huge, or really tall, sorry. Um, so yeah, so that's where we have enlargements because our nerves need to be able to reach our fingertips. And for that reason, we have them here. And the same goes for our legs. You see the, the lumbar enlargement is from L2 to S3. What do we have down there? We have our hips and our legs. And so again, the nerves need to reach the very tip of our pinky or our big toe. So that's where we have that. <clears throat> um, uh, where are motor tracks found and what are their function? Where are sensory tracks found and what are their 
function. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, so that goes back to the tracks. The tracks again are a grouping of nerves that originate and end in the same place. So these could be tracks and these could be tracks. Motor tracks basically are the ones that are the descending, the descending tracks. They're sending information or motor commands from the brain to the spinal cord. And the sensory tracks are the ascending tracks. They are sending the information from the outside to the brain and spinal cord, letting everyone know, hey, we're basic, we're sitting outside and it's 90 degrees. It's time for you to start sweating or like activate the sweat, the sweat switch so that we don't overheat. Um, okay. Okay, the nerves. What are the what are the nerves found within the cervical, lumbar, and sacral plexus? Um, so here we have the plex plexi. Basically, they're just a grouping of nerves um, that are important for different things. Um, I'm not sure how in depth you need to go into understanding understanding the nerves. Um, like if you need to know like c1 through c5 compose the cervical plexus but this is taken from his powerpoint and he circled this so i think you guys might have to pay attention to that so yeah so the cervical plexus is uh composed of c1 through c5 um and that's right here along with all the other nerves that we have in our face and neck um the lumbar plexus you have from T12 to L5. The and the sacral plexus you have from L4 to S4, or your coccyx, I guess. And a really big one that you see here is the sciatic nerve. Um. Yeah, I don't know how in depth he's gonna get into that. And I'm gonna write a question. Let me ask him so that I can tell you guys. Let you guys know because this is a lot of stuff. Okay, so <clears throat> okay. Excuse me. Moving on. Um. Do, do, do. Okay. So what is a mixed nerve? Um, a mixed nerve is basically a combination of both um, a motor and sensory nerve. Um, we have those two. They're they're great because if you if it's um if it's something that needs to be relayed quickly to your brain, then that's where that one comes in. Um afferent nerves run dorsally or ventrally. So remember Dave. So dorsal means afferent. Afferent means ascending to the brain. So so posterior, dorsal, afferent, brain. I don't, I can't give you a mnemonic there. I don't know. Dave is the best thing that we have. And uh, VE, so afferent nerves run ventrally and they are um, the ones that are descending. Oh, okay. Hold on. Because this is not the same thing. Um, afferents run dorsally and the ones that run dorsally are the ascending tracks okay and the efferents run ventrally and they're the descending tracks I think it's a little confusing so let's let's think of this so efferents run ventrally which are your descending tracks so think brain and then your afferent run dorsally and they're your ascending tracks so think sensory i'm so sorry guys i don't i can't give you a better mnemonic um but yeah so just remember dave that's gonna be um that's gonna be like a um like a couple questions on the exam for sure um okay the action potential 
Okay, so let's talk about action potentials. Action potentials are basically um, ways that your neurons can send signals to other neurons to have things happen in your muscles or organs. That's the most general layman's terms I can give you. <clears throat> now, the actual things that occur in the action potential, let's get into that. So you have a resting memory potential of negative 70 millivolts. Basically what that means is that inside of your axon, you are at negative 70. So you're at a very negative number and this is where everybody is in a relaxed state. Now let's say the brain wants you to move your, your hand and we wanna send that signal down. We don't have uh, messengers like UPS or FedEx, people that can move from our brain to our hand to move it, we have our neurons. And what happens is that these neurons can fire and tell other neurons to continuously send the message until it reaches the organ or the muscle that, is it, that it is affecting and creates that, that flex or that stretch. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so... Uh, the reason that we are able to move is because of the action potential. So ultimately what happens is that once that, that signal is received from the dendrite, the, the cell body then like sends it off. It starts off here. And ultimately we're going to propagate this signal all the way down here. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use sodium and potassium. Sodium on the outside, which is a positive, and potassium on the inside. So we have channels that are um that allow for the 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 diffusion of sodium and potassium so these channels are always open they're called leaky channels because they kind of leak sodium and potassium kind of like a, uh, a halfway open faucet with the with the drops it's leaking um so we have an influx of sodium rushing into the cell so from this resting membrane potential of negative 70, it goes up to something like negative 50, which is more positive than what we had initially. <clears throat> so once this one is come in, what happens is that it triggers the next, um, the adjacent portion of that axon to do the same thing. So here we see that it's like right next to each other, but this is a little bit more, um, this, exp like, this looks a little bit more like realistic in the sense that there are a couple of separation, there's a separation between the two. And so when the sodium comes in, it basically triggers this next part of the cell, the axon, to then let sodium in. And then it continuously does that until it reaches the end where it can release the neurotransmitter. Um, so that's, that's the action potential and that is how it is propagated. Um, to restore it back to its original negative 70 millivolts, you repolarize. Oh, okay, so let's get into that. So the repolarization and the hyperpolarization. So here is a actual graph. So we're at negative 70 here. The threshold is basically, this is what we need in order to, it needs to be able to depolarize enough so that it sends it out that it sends out the action potential. That is called an all or nothing principle. So let's say if you have a depolarization of, of um, negative 60, that isn't high enough to send an action potential through in order to get a response from the affected organs or cells. Um, and that can happen. You can have very small um, increases in, in the resting potential, but it won't be enough in order to send out an action potential. So once we hit negative 50, this threshold that we need to cross, once we hit that, it gets propagated. And once it's like, this is at its peak. And once it's done being propagated and the cells in that area, for example, want to go back to their original membrane potential, they repolarize, which means that the sodium is then pushed out of the cell where it originally came into and potassium is now back into the cell through the sodium potassium pump which we have here so for every three sodiums out we have two potassiums in that's a good way it's called a um 
Oh, it slipped my mind. It's a co-transport enzyme. Basically, we move two things at once. So receiving energy. And so we move the potassium back into the cell. And it then restores this negative 70 millivolts, the resting membrane potential. And that's repolarization. But it gets a little lower because obviously it's trying to get to the to to the membrane potential. So like let's think of it as like an overshoot. It overshoots it by a little, but then it takes it back to its original resting point. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's essentially like the action potential and the steps that happen. We have passive forces, which are the leaky channels, which allow sodium and potassium to throw um free um float in and out of the cell as they please and then we have active forces such as the sodium and potassium pump which needs atp to function and this one basically helps mitigate the amount of sodium and potassium within the neuron the axon within the cell um to keep it at that negative 70 millivolt um Yes. So now, what is the transmembrane potential? We already went over that. Um, so let's talk about created potentials. This picture isn't very clear. This is all in your um, PowerPoints. Um, so greater potentials can depolarize or hyperpolarize. Action potentials are always depolarizing. Depolarizing means that they're becoming more positive. Greater potentials can become more positive or more negative. Um, the action potentials have to reach a threshold before the action potential can be propagated through the cell, whereas graded potentials don't need any thresholds. Um, action potentials have an all or nothing principle, which is basically saying that if you if you pass the threshold, then the action potential will be propagated in the same magnitude every single time. Whereas a graded potential, there really isn't, um, it will not propagate in the same magnitude. It will depend on the intensity of the stimulus. Uh, graded potentials are usually found um, when you're trying to induce an action potential and are also found not only in neurons, but in other cells. Um, Action potential at one site depolarizes adjacent sites to threshold. So that's how we can jump from this part of the axon to this part because it's jumping. Whereas um, a greater potential is a, is a passive spread from site of stimulation. So this one basically, what that one's saying is that the action potential is insinuating to push that following domino down the line, where the greater potential doesn't necessarily. Um, insinuate to push that that domino if it happens it happens if it doesn't it doesn't it's kind of like um if you spill water on a table it's a very passive spread of the water it can either reach the the edge of the table and spill over the the table or it doesn't or it stays confined within the table um effect on membrane potential decreases with distance from stimulation site so if it travels down here it'll probably won't it probably will not be as strong as it as the place that it initiated whereas this one if it travels down it will be just as strong um no refractory period refractory period uh so your action potential because it has to repolarize like i showed you guys in this picture there is a period in which this cannot fire again um whereas in a graded potential because there isn't like a repolarization there is no refractory period so you can consistently keep fire firing the potentials um, occurs only in excitable membranes specialized cells such as neurons and muscle cells so action potentials can only occur in neurons and muscle cells whereas graded potentials can occur in, in most plasma membranes again so graded potentials can occur in the majority of cells whereas action potentials cannot question do you know if you asked for the location of each potential on the neuron? Um, hmm. I don't think so. But let me ask him that. Location of each potential. 
it doesn't seem like a big picture question, but it might be one of the details that he's going to be asking you guys. So I will definitely um, ask him and let you know. Okay, so that's pretty much it. That's a lot of, I know it's a lot of information, guys. Um, the action potential. There is a great video um, on YouTube by the channel Crash Course. You go into there and you look up Crash Course, Crash Course Action Potentials. And the guy that speaks, he's a funny dude, but he he relays the information very clearly, and there are um, animations that accompany it, and it's very helpful. What is spatial summation and temporal summation? Okay, so types of summation, temporal summation, basically what happens is that one neuron is firing, into this larger like larger neuron um, and what happens is that it trans it like translates that signal over and it fires so it's basically a one to one and it's the same magnitude so you see here how there's a high frequency there's more little red lines and there are the same amount of red lines so temporal summation basically is if one neuron fires with, let's say, a magnitude of 50, then the postsynaptic neuron will fire with that same magnitude of 50. Whereas spatial summation, maybe you have three neurons that are firing and they're all firing at a magnitude of, of five, right? Um, so five times three is 15. So then this one, this postsynaptic neuron, would fire at a magnitude of 15 because it's adding all of the magnitudes in which the, these neurons fired originally. So again, so spatial summation is where multiple neurons fire at a lower magnitude than the postsynaptic neuron, which fires at the summation of that magnitude. Whereas temporal summation, maybe you have a couple, one or two neurons that are firing at the same magnitude in which the postsynaptic neuron is firing. So 15 to 15, 5 to 15, if that makes sense. <clears throat> okay, so what is the all or nothing principle, the all or none? It states that the strength of response of a nerve cell or muscle fiber is not dependent upon the strength of the stimulus. If the stimulus is above a certain threshold, a nerve or muscle fiber will fire. So yeah, so this is um, for action potential. So it doesn't matter how strong of a stimulus whether it's 15 or 5 if we cross that threshold it'll fire at the same magnitude in which it always fires and if let's say that magnitude is 50 50 five zero, then it'll always fire at a magnitude of 50. okay are we good any questions okay Um, what is the sodium potassium pump? When do we use sodium the sodium potassium pump? What is the ratio of sodium to potassium? Okay, so the sodium potassium pump is this pump right here. There are three oh, oh okay, the all or nothing principle. Um okay. Um, let's see, let's see. So, in other words, we can say, okay. So you have an action potential, which is the response of a neuron being stimulated to send a signal down its axon. Okay, this action potential, let's translate that to you walking outside to walk your dog, to take your dog out for a stroll. Um, there needs to be a certain threshold that needs to be broken in order for the action potential to occur, right? So in this case, if your dog is scratching at the door, that would be the threshold. Hey, let's go walk the dog. Um, and every time you walk your dog, there isn't a, you know, you don't 
maybe walk him or her for five seconds or you take them out to the front yard but every single time that you walk your dog you go and you walk at least for a mile so let's say that you have a stimulus that is maybe your dog like being a little playful or excuse me being a little playful or maybe he's scratching at the door or he sh or she's scratching at the door but that doesn't necessarily that's not the command that you taught him or her to ask to go to the bathroom but it leads you to believe that they might have to go to the bathroom it doesn't matter whether your dog needs to go to the bathroom or is playing around you no matter what are going to walk your dog for at least a mile that is the all or nothing principle so it doesn't matter if there are let's say five three different neurons firing at a very low um, magnitude. Once it crosses that threshold, the, the action potential will always end up being in the same magnitude. Let's say this is an arbitrary number, um, 50. Oh, okay, you got it. Okay, so yeah, so, so no matter what, whether it's a small um, stimulus or a big stimulus, as long as it crosses that threshold, you're still going to go around the block or walk for however long it takes to walk a mile. So yeah, okay. Question. You're welcome. Okay, so what is the sodium potassium pump? When do we use the sodium potassium pump? And what is the ratio of sodium to potassium? Okay, so the sodium potassium pump is a pump that we use to control the levels of sodium potassium inside the cell. Um, the sodium potassium pump, the ratios are three sodium for every two potassium. I'm sorry that this figure isn't as clear as I would have liked it to be. Um, but yeah, it's this dude right here. Um, you need ATP or energy to make it work. Um, so yeah, uh, for the sodium, what do we use? The ratio, the opening of the sodium channels in the membrane causes depolarization or repolarization. Okay, so. So back again to our interior of the cell, which is a negative 70 millivolts. We have sodium, which are positive ions on the outside free floating. And then we have a less amount of potassium on the inside, creating a negative um, charge in the, in the cell. So when sodium rushes in, it depolariza depolarizes it or makes it more positive. So it goes from negative 70 to possibly negative 50 if we want to get an action potential or a negative 60, but it essentially depolarizes it. Um, what is a leaky membrane channel characterized by? A leaky membrane channel would be these guys. These are basically open doors for the sodium and potassium to go in and out as they please. Um, they're characterized by not using ATP, and um, they're called leaky because the, the flow never stops. It'll continuously leak out. Um, so yeah, what is a voltage membrane channel characterized by? So a voltage membrane channel, um, basically these guys, uh, voltage gated, so they're membrane channels, we don't have a picture of them here, but they're basically like these types of enzymes that only open at a certain voltage. So you have to pay to exit the door, essentially. The same as chemical membrane channels. So it has to be a certain chemical or ion. So let's say, for example, there are channels that are only receptive or allow sodium to pass through. Um, so way back in the day when this was a thing during um, the 60s and the segregation. You know, there would be the whites or the blacks, um, you know, the seg segregated. Doors. It's kind of the same idea. Sorry for the very terrible analogy. Um, mechanical membrane channel characterized by. Um, a mechanical membrane channel basically is a membrane channel that is that opens and closes. Like, it, it has a movement and... Um, that's pretty much it, depending on what ions it binds to. It either moves to the extracellular space or the intracellular space, kind of like our sodium potassium pump. Um, what are all the ions that participate in an action potential? Well, 
we have sodium and potassium. Those are those are the dudes. Those are the the peeps that uh, participate there. <clears throat> Okay, where is the synaptic knob? Okay, so this is starting to sound a little bit more like the muscles chapter that we already covered. Um, the synaptic knob is basically at the very end of our neuron. This is our neuron. It's a very pretty, it's a very nice picture of a neuron. Um, what is the function of the vesicles? So at the end of the synaptic knob, when the action potential reaches it, it then signals the... Um, Oh no, I'm so sorry. That's wrong. The action potential uh, carries electrical impulses and signals. Um, the vesicles carry neurotransmitters. So in the cell body of your neuron, you have your Golgi apparatus, which is this thing right here. It, um, it is signaled by the nucleus to prepackage um, neurotransmitters, whether it's acetylcholine or GABA or norepinephrine or epinephrine. These guys get packaged and they get taken down the axon through these um, these carrier proteins, kinesin and dianin, um, which you guys don't really have to know the name of the, the proteins, but just in case you're wondering, um, kinesin moves uh, the these vesicles to the synaptic terminal, so this end, and dianin moves the vesicles towards the cell body. Um, and once they reach the very end of the synaptic knob, what happens is that they basically morph to the cell, to the plasma membrane at the end, and they release their contents into the synaptic terminal, which is like a little cleft right here, the synaptic cleft, sorry, and then it then gets received by the other cell in which they're trying to um, affect. Um, what happens with, okay, so I already told you guys, so the synaptic knob, the, the movement of the vesicles, so ultimately to, to release the neurotransmitters. What are the most common types of synapses <clears throat> in the nervous system? Name two, syn two types of synapse and their corresponding neurotransmitters. <clears throat> okay, types of synapses, uh, I don't have that here. Um, oh! I think it's talking about the muscarinic and cholinergic. So let's look that up really quick. Synapses in the nervous system. Oh, just kidding. Chemical and electro, well, electrical, which makes sense. So chemical, because we're releasing the neurotransmitter here at the end, right? into an effector organ or muscle and chemical and electrical sorry if we're tr like communicating from um neuron to neuron oh, sure. i need to start leaving i have another class at 10 but thank you yeah no no worries i'm gonna continue guys because there's a there's a very long um exam review but um again this is being recorded so you can just look at the recording after you're done after i'm done and you can play it back <clears throat> so if those of you that need to go, go ahead. Everybody else that wants to stay and hear me talk, you're more than welcome to. Um, so yeah, so we have chemical and electrical. Um, chemical, no transmitters, electrical, the uh, action potential being trans, uh, transferred over to another um, neuron. And uh, two types of, and the corresponding neurotransmitters, so... Let's see. We have two types of synapses found in the body, electrical, okay, and neurotransmitters. Let's see. Okay, we'll leave that one for last because <laughs> I don't want to. Um, waste more time. Okay, where are neurotransmitters produced within the neuron? So neurotransmitters are produced um, right here. So the nucleus, of, nu the nucleus, sorry, the nucleus sends out a signal to the ribosomes um, to start making neurotransmitters. Um, they get 
formed either in the smooth ER or the rough ER, depending. They get then sent over to the Golgi to be prepackaged, to be packaged and sent off. And then they end up moving to the end of the synaptic terminal um, at the synaptic knob to be released. So what is the main function of dopamine? Dopamine, what do we have here? Dopamine, according to this, is a pleasure trans uh, neurotransmitter. So dopamine makes you feel happy. Um, main function of serotonin. Serotonin is mood. It affects mood. Um, and acetylcholine. We have acetylcholine. It's an excitatory a neurotransmitter. So it usually is used for um, muscle contraction and also learning. Yeah. This slide is also in your PowerPoints. <clears throat> okay. Um, reflexes. What is a stretch reflex? So we have this here. So basically a stretch reflex is something that happens when your muscle is stretched, as the name suggests. So a, a perfect example of this one is um, the one where they test your reflexes with your for your knee. So the doctor's hitting that little space that'll basically excite that muscle and what happens is that instead of sending it sending that information or that stimuli all the way up the spinal cord into the brain and then all the way down for it to say move there is a little arc or um i guess shortcut that it takes that in certain cases usually when we're in danger so like if we're burning our hands or they're doing something like this or testing our reflexes, how fast we respond, um, it goes right in and out and it contracts the leg. So the same for um, if we are in a situation where we're gonna burn a finger or a hand, like immediately we feel that heat or pain response, we pull our hand away without having to think twice about it. We don't have to send the signal all the way up the spinal cord to the brain and then all the way down to say, hey, move your hand, but rather, the signal gets um, bypassed into this sh like shortcut and it can um, move. So it's a very primal instinct or reflex that we have. <clears throat> uh, define reflex. Um, well, it reflex. Uh, involuntary predictable motor response to stimuli. Those are the reflexes. Uh, tone. Um, Tension of muscle at rest, mobility, range of motion around two joints. So you only have you have limited mobility of your humerus, of your shoulder, like how far you can move it up and down, like and the angle in which you can move it. Same with your hip joint, same with your knee joint. Um, a positive feedback loop. <clears throat> okay, so in order to explain a positive feedback loop, we have to understand what a negative feedback loop is. Um, a negative feedback loop basically is something that um, we have a system. So for example, the air conditioning. I don't know if you guys can hear my air conditioning. <clears throat> it has a thermostat that says um, 75. So the ideal temperature of the house would be 75, a consistent 75. If the thermostat for some reason um, reads that the temperature in the house currently is at 77 or 78, what it will do is it'll turn on the air conditioning up until it reaches the internal temperature goes back down to 75 and once it reaches 75 the air conditioning stops so that's negative so you activate it reaches its target it stops it deactivates um, that's basically the gist like the very general um, definition of a negative feedback loop a positive feedback loop is something that isn't usually seen it's very rare and it's something that when it starts, it continuously happens. So let's say, for example, if my air conditioning is broken, right? So the thermostat reads that it's uh, 78 in the house and we have it set for 75. And once the air condition, the, the internal temperature of the house now says that it's 75, the air conditioning does not stop and it continuously keeps firing to keep lowering the temperature, even though it has already surpassed its point of 75 degrees. Um, we see this in, like, in anatomy, we see this with childbirth, um, oxytocin, 
once oxytocin is released when the mother is um, getting ready to give birth or in the process of birth, um, oxytocin helps with the contractions. So once we have an initial release of oxytocin, all it does from there is it continuously releases. And once it has um, like run out, essentially, does it stop? Or there's another mechanism that stops it. I'm not, I'm not too sure about that one. But ultimately, once contractions start, they do not stop. That is a positive feedback loop, um, the same way with a broken air conditioner. <clears throat> Um, reflex, different reflexes, neuropathologies. Okay, um, so we're almost done because this is the very end. Um, so neuropathologies, what is an upper motor uh, lesion, a lesion of the neural pathway above the anterior horn of the spinal cord? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. What is a lower motor lesion, lesion that affects the nerve fibers traveling from the anterior horn of the spinal cord to the associated muscle? So basically, when you cut a nerve that either works for the upper motor, so for the ascending or descending, if you cut it, the connection is lost, and so you have a lesion. And it depends which connection you affect. So if you're working with your ascending, um, that would be an upper motor lesion because it's affecting the information that is being sent to the brain. And if you cut it in your descending tracks, it would be a lower motor uh, lesion because it would be affecting the information that is being sent out to the muscles um, from the brain. Okay, what is an epidural block? So this is basically like a procedure that some people um, who are giving childbirth uh, go under to basically numb the lower part of their extremities to not feel the pain that is giving birth to a child. Um, this is where they go in. They go in between L3 and L4 with a needle. And there are two types of blocks. You have an epidural block and you have a subdural block. Epidural, epi means above. So you put in the anesthetic above the dura. And a subdural block is where the anesthetic is below the dura. So you see how this one is flowing outwardly to above to the upper part of the dura, whereas this one is flowing outwardly to the lower part of the dura. That's the difference between the two. And again, that's a subdural block there. Um, a spinal tap, or otherwise known as a lumbar puncture, basically is when you get a very long needle and you wedge it in between L4 and L5 in this um, space right here in your subarachnoid space to um, collect a sample of your cerebrospinal fluid for testing. Um, certain diseases can be determined um, by doing so. This is also very dangerous because if, you know, for some reason you move or whatever, you can affect any of these nerves that you see here. Um, meningitis is the infection of the meninges. So these are your meninges normally. Here, this is a CSF. These are, you know, the veins and the arteries that travel through your brain. Um, here are the layers. If you have uh, meningitis, then your cerebral spinal fluid is infected with bacteria. Um, you have the tissue is swollen and inflamed because you have an immune response that is being triggered by this um, um, pathogen, and so it's not a good. It's not a good time. I remember in high school, there was a kid in my friend's high school that um, seemingly passed away out of nowhere because he um, he had meningitis, bacterial meningitis, which is like highly infectious. Um, and everybody thought he just had a cold. Not to scare you guys, but it just it's it's one of those things that happen. Um, what is valerian disease? Um, it's the active process of the generation that results when a nerve fiber is cut or crushed by part of the axon and the part of the axon of the axon distal to the injury. So if you get into or if somebody if the person whose neurons these belong to um, got into an accident and for some reason the neuron the axon got cut um, because there is no longer communication between the cell body and this axon the end um, it will continually 
to generate because there is no information, there is no um, constant flow of ions in and out. And so ultimately it just degenerates because the, the cells or your body have to pick that up um, and recycle it. And so if it's, not, if it's broken, we get rid of it essentially. Poliomyelitis is basically the destruction of the ventral horn motor neurons by poliovirus. So polio, this used to be a really big thing back when FDR was a child, that he, um, I think he had polio, that that's why he was in a wheelchair. wheelchair. I may be wrong, I'm not sure. Um, essentially what it does is that it leads to muscle atrophy because it's destroying the ventral horn of the motor neurons. Um, so yeah, so it's not it's not a good time, and ultimately it gets to the point where it's destroying um, the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. So the somatic, where you can like voluntary muscle control, and the autonomic, the involuntary muscle control, um, which ultimately can lead you to stop breathing and ultimately death. People that have suffered from polio that have survived. Um, at the very end, they're put into these gas chambers where they're like there's negative and positive pressure that helps them breathe, and they can't move because their body, like the nervous system, doesn't function. So that's fun, um, and that's pretty much it. We have finished. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? Have I bored you? Yeah, let me take this off, screen sharing. Um, how does everybody feel? Um, I need feedback, guys. Question, is there any place where we can like see the, um, the answers of the review guide or we have to do it by ourselves? Okay, that's a really good question, Camila. Thank you for asking. Um, so ultimately, the review is for you guys to have a better understanding and a better handle of the material. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, there are no um, answers to the review, like mm -hmm. written answers. It's up to you how you want to fill it out. My review, as you can see, is um, just pictures. Um, I personally learn um, better with pictures, but if you need something that is written and stuff, um, that would just be great for you to go ahead and do. Um, but ultimately, doing the review has always and will always help you guys on the exam. That's yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Do. Okay. Anybody else? Any other questions? <clears throat> Comments, concerns? Again, I'm going to ask him if you guys need to know which nerves are within the cervical plexus, um, all the plexi, I guess you can say, um, and if we need to know the location of the action or graded potentials. I will get to you guys. I will get back to you guys on that. Send you all a mass email. So essentially, we would take the test this week. Yes, essentially. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, so ideally every Friday you guys would be prepared enough to go ahead and take the test. Um, of course, this is not the case for everyone. Um, so ideally for you guys, just to stay on top of your material, um, if it means maybe postponing it to Saturday and Sunday, that's totally okay. We are, you know, understanding of everyone. Um, so yeah, but Ideally, you would keep it within the week. That way, you know, the concepts and um, the material doesn't get crossed over. Um, so in terms of, like, organization for yourself. Are you having another live session after this? You're welcome. Yes, so everybody that was in the 9 a.m. session, thank you all for participating. Um, and being part of it, I'm going to continue with the 10 a.m. session. So whoever w is in Dr. Garcia's 10 a.m. class, just stick around, everybody else. If you don't have any questions or anything like that, you are more than welcome to enjoy the rest of your day.
You're welcome. Okay, guys, um, how many people are in your class? There's a good amount. There was probably 20, 20 oh. people, 20 minutes. Okay, if you have a WhatsApp group, can you please let them know to log into the live session, live exam review session, please? Uh, yeah, let me get my phone. Awesome, thank you. Luis, you have a question. Not just yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Luis, do you have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started because um, we're running a little late. So let's go ahead and do that. This um, session has already been recorded and is still recording. Um, and if I don't get a chance to go over something due to time constraints or if someone has to go, that's totally okay. I have already gone over the exam review once with the previous class. So um, just keep that in mind. If you have any questions or you want to go refer back to the to the review, um, like I said, it has it is currently being recorded, so you can definitely pull it up at your leisure um, and go ahead and 
uh, read through it. Um, okay, let's start. So much to cover. So let me do this. Okay, you guys can see this. Cool. Okay, so uh, very quickly, what is the overall function of the nervous system? The nervous system is basically the master, um, the puppet master. So it controls um, the sensory input, the integration, and the motor output. So you're being given information, whether it's uh, visual, auditory, um, gustatory. Um, you then integrate it. So you when you're tasting something, you're thinking of the taste, or you're receiving information from what you're tasting. So if it's sour, if it's sweet, if it's umami. Um, and the motor output. So if, for example, you are, if you see that someone's running towards you, you're in your head, you're thinking, okay, so this person is running towards me. What do they want? And they have an aggressive face, uh, look on their face. Then maybe your motor output would be, hey, let's run to the opposite direction in which this guy is, or this person is running towards me because I don't know what they want with me. I don't know them. So yeah, so the nervous tissue, the brain and spinal cord, the nervous system is the puppet master. Um, okay, so we have two divisions. We have our CNS, our central nervous system, and our PNS, our peripheral nervous system. Our central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and our peripheral nervous system consists of all of the nerves that um, branch out of the spinal cord. Um, within our PNS, we have a, another breakdown. We have somatic and autonomic. Um, with from the motor division. So we have the autonomic nervous system, which controls the viscera. So it's involuntary movement, um, which essentially is, you know, regulation of heartbeat, regulation of breath, peristalsis for your stomach and your digestive system um, and that. And somatic, which is basically voluntary movement. So, um, if you want to move your arm, you can move your arm and you can think about it and you can go ahead and move it. I'm currently moving my arm, so I'm using my somatic nervous system. Okay, so the layers of the neuron we have are, essentially I think this question is asking me is um, if, I'm sorry, um, everybody who is here, please go ahead and mute your mics. Um, so yeah, so the layers of the neuron, we have our neurolemma, which are, is basically the outer layer of the plasma membrane of the Schwann cells. The Schwann cells are these little yellow things. Um, our axolemma, which is a plasma membrane of the axon. We have our cell body, uh, our nasal bodies, which are the inside, the nucleus, and we have dendrites. Um, essentially, I think that's what that question is asking. Myelination is basically the production and the wrapping of myelin sheath around the axon, which is a great conductor to propagate electrical impulses. Um, Non-myelination essentially is the lack of myelin sheath on the axon to conduct electrical impulses. Um, and ultimately what happens, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it is an analogy that I can give you for how amazing um, myelin is for axons is if we're boiling water, a pot of water, if we want the water to boil fast, we will top it off, which would be the myelin, so that it doesn't lose any heat and it can boil at a faster rate. Um, and non-myelinated axons are basically a pot of water boiling but with the top off. So you're losing heat to the environment. And as a result, it will take longer time for your water to boil. So that's how important myelin is for our nerves. And there are certain um, neuropathies that include the, the, the degradation of the myelin within our axons, which is really bad. Um, but yeah, put these later. Um, the speed of conduction, again, 
if you have a myelinated axon, your speed of conduction will be much higher than your unmyelinated axon. Uh, resistance, what we looked up um, in the previous class, we saw that um, the voltage is dependent on the, the, the current and the resistance. So our voltage will continuously be of the same magnitude if we have little resistance and uh, and a constant current um, which essentially means that our signal will be propagated down if there is little resistance if there is a constant current and it like the voltage will not be will not alter in its magnitude whether it lowers or um, gets higher it'll be static what are the two types of conduction? We have saltatory conduction, which we have here, which is basically jumping from node to node. And we have um, continuous conduction, uh, as one of your classmates um, previously mentioned in the, in the chat. Um, and saltatory, like the word says, saltar, uh, which means jump in Spanish. It jumps from node to node, where continuous is one continuous line, uh, not jumping. Um, okay, so unipolar, multipolar, bipolar neurons. So bipolar neurons are found um, in your special senses. They have a reception end, which is the dendrites. Um, they have their cell body, the axon, and their synaptic terminals. They are, as you can see here, they are smaller in size. Um, Multiple, uh, unipolar neuron, sorry, is a neuron that has dendrites at its receiving end. The axon, a much longer axon, its cell body is not integrated into the axon and it continuously, the axon can continue, continues up to the synaptic terminals. Um, these guys are much longer. They're usually found in your peripheral nervous system and usually help with the movement of sensory information. Multipolar neuron is a neuron that has a lot of receiving ends, as you can see here. Its cell body starts here at, at the beginning, at the receiving end, unlike these guys. Uh, its axon continues and it has its synaptic terminals like every other one. These guys are usually found within your CNS um, and uh, transfer information from neuron to neuron to then be propagated down. Um, what is a sensory neuron? What is an interneuron? So we have sensory neurons that carry information, sensory or afferent neurons that carry information towards the central nervous system. Um, and we have interneurons, which carry impulses between sensory and motor neurons. Um, Basically, they're, they are the in-between guys. They're the bridge between the two. Um, what are Schwann cells? What are oligodendrocytes? So essentially, a Schwann cell is this thing right here. It's a cell that has a lot of myelin that erupts around the axon. The difference between the two is that the Schwann cell is found in the PNS, whereas the oligodendrocyte is found in the CNS. And something that I didn't mention in the class before, but I'll mention now, um, the Schwann cell can regenerate, whereas the oligodendrocyte cannot, which is why it's very important um, just to eat healthy and to take care of yourself. Um, and the oligodendrocytes are found within the brain, um, within the neurons of the brain. Um, do, 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 okay. Uh, what are the structures that protect the brain and the spinal cord? Where are the meninges? So here is a lovely picture that I found um, that basically shows you all the structures that protect, protect the brain and spinal cord. Uh, here we have the scalp, the skull, the periosteal dura mater, which essentially means, peri means surrounding, osteal means bone, and dura mater refers to the that meninge, the dura mater. And essentially it's, that's the part that touches the bone of the dura mater. And then we have the meningeal dura mater, which is the part of the dura mater that touches the meninges. But these two are together. They just separated them so that it could be a better, uh, we could visualize. 
Then we have the arachnoid matter, which is this thin gray sheet right here. We have the subarachnoid space, which is where all the blood vessels live, which is this right here. And lastly, we have the pia matter, which is a very thin layer covering that um, lines the entire cerebral cortex. Um, what is the function of CSF? So cerebral spinal fluid, basically what it does is that it allows for your brain to free float in your skull and as a result it cushions it thus supporting the brain it transports nutrients chemical messengers and waste products um, from the brain to the um, to one of the sinuses in our in our heads to then be transported to the blood to then you know start the process all over again it is a continuous um, cycle and it's uh, self-cleaning i guess you can say what produces CSF and where is it found? Well, we have ep ependymal cells. Sorry, I can't say that word. Ependymal cells that form part of the choroid plexus, which line off four ventricles that produce the CSF fluid. Um, so yeah, so ependymal cells in the choroid plexus that line off four ventricles, that is where C CSF fluid is produced. What is the most abundant glial cell of the CNS and what is its function? Astrocytes are the most abundant cell, glial cell of the CNS and their function is to um, be part of the blood-brain barrier, otherwise known as the BBB. Um, essentially what the blood-brain barrier does, <clears throat> excuse me, is that it monitors what is coming in and out of the brain, in the blood. So the analogy that I used is the bouncer for the VIP lounge in a very, you know, I don't know, fancy club. Um, he or she is making sure that the people that are coming in, in and out of that, of the VIP lounge area are, you know, good people or they're good looking or the celebrities or stuff like that. Like it's very um, highly selective. And so, yeah, so that's what the blood brain barrier does. That's why people that, um, OD on drugs or get very close to ODing, um, surprisingly enough, it's like they don't have any, um, um, I don't know, um, cognitive um, malformations, I guess you could say, or cognitive impairments, there you go. Um, it's because of the blood-brain barrier. It accounts for the chemicals and nutrients and ions that are coming into the, into the body, and it highly selects for them to make sure that nothing bad can pass through. The only thing that it, it allows to pass through is sugar um, because our brain needs sugar to function. <clears throat> okay, any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Is everyone good? I need to know, guys. Help me out. So far, so good. Awesome, thank you so much for the response. <clears throat> okay, cool. Oh, we only have one. Everything is good. Okay, thank you, Rosemary, Andrea, and Patricia, and Jose. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, cool. So, what is the difference between columns, tracts, horns, and cortex? Um, so, the very easy one, cortex, is just the outer or superficial layer of an organ. So, the cerebral cortex, um, kidney cortex, I think kidney we have a name for that one um just the superficial or outer layer of an organ okay now let's get into the part that's a little confusing so columns tracks and horns a track is a grouping of nerves that all originate and end at the same place they can be ascending or descending so here's a picture so these guys right here these guys are blue so they are they are ascending tracks and they're just a grouping of nerves that all kind of do the same function. These red guys are right here are descending tracks and they're just a grouping of nerves that do the same function. So that's what tracks are. Now we can also have columns that do the same thing. So we have columns right here that are a grouping of nerves that can either ascend, um, that are either um, sensory or motor that can carry information ascending or descending depending on um, the nerve that they're using um, 
And horns are these guys in the gray matter and depending on their location. So for example, here, the ventral or anterior horn roots, uh, horn, sorry, goes into the ventral or anterior roots and it goes into the muscle or effector organ. So this one is, um, is, Karen said, uh, is motor, is descending because it's sending information to the effector muscle or organ. Whereas this one in the posterior, it's receiving information from the sensory receptor, um, sen sensory information, sorry, and it's sending it into the spinal cord to then be transferred over to the brain. So that's the difference between these guys. It can be a little confusing. I suggest that you spend at least 20 minutes of your study time to really understand the difference between all of them. Um, and Dave. Dave is down here. We're going to talk about that right now because I think that's a little bit more important um, and it makes a little bit more sense. Um, Dave, so afferent nerves run dorsally or ventrally. According to Dave, afferent nerves run dorsally. And the nerves that run dorsally are the ascending or the sensory nerves. So they're receiving information from the outside and they're going up to the brain. The efferent nerves run ventrally, ventral, efferent, and these guys are the descending tracks. They're carrying motor commands um, from the brain to the spinal cord. Okay, so this, very important. I'm going to put an asterisk here. Very important to understand because, as you can see, they use different words to describe them such as descending and ascending, um, afferent and efferent. What you're lucky with, though, is that afferent nerves run dorsally and the ascending tracks run dorsally. So here, uh, afferent and ascending, you can make them right there. And then the other one, descending or efferent, they have E right here, efferent, descending. So these are ventrally, and um, ventral is also spelled with an E, so maybe that's a good connection there, E, E, E. Um, a mixed nerve is basically a nerve that is uh, half motor, half uh, sensory nerve. That's pretty much that one. Okay, let's get back to this. Okay, so where are the enlargements of the spinal cord located and why do they form? So we have enlargements right here. We have them at C4 to T2 and at L2 to S3. The reason that they form is because what do we have at L2 to S3? What connects to our, um, what connects to our hips, I guess, or what is at the bottom of our spinal cord? Our legs, right? We have legs. So we have these enlargements because we want to make sure that the nerves travel down to the very tip of our toes and the very tip of our fingertips because here is where we would have our arms, our limbs. What are their function? In order to extend to the limbs. That's the function of the enlargements. Um, where are motor tracts found and what are their function? Where are sensory tracts found and what are their function? So motor tracts are usually found. Um, they're right here. They're the descending tracks, they're usually found right here, and their function is to carry motor commands from the brain to the spinal cord. Our, what was the other one? What are sensory tracks? Where are sensory tracks? So they're right here. Uh, and what do they do? They carry sensory, sensory information towards the brain. Again, this is all in chapter 12 and 13 of the PowerPoints that he has available to you. I'm not using any pictures that are not available to you guys. Um, so yeah, so go ahead and take a look at that. I suggest, again, spend a good chunk of your time really understanding this part because it can be very confusing. And um, there are a couple of questions on the exam that pertain to this. Okay. What are the nerves found within the cervical plexus, lumbar and sacral plexus? I'm not sure how in depth he's going to ask you guys this, but I guess it's just good to know that the cervical plexus is composed of C1 to C5. Your lumbar plexus is composed from T12 to L5. 
and your sacral plexus is composed from L4 all the way down to your coccyx. And a big nerve to note here is the sciatic nerve. Um, okay, cool. We went over this part. Action potential. Okay, so this is fun. So action potential, let's go down here. Essentially, an action potential is just a signal that is being propagated from neuron to neuron. It is one of the two ways um, that we can um, send signals or have signals sent to the body. There is a question here that asks that. Um, let me see. So, yeah, so it's one of the two types of synapses that we have. So um, we have electrical and chemical synapses. Um, a chemical synapse corresponds to neurotransmitters being released, where an electrical synapse corresponds to an electrical impulse being propagated. Um, so yeah, so the action potential is part of that um, electrical impulse. So let's get into it. So your cell, this happens in the axon, we have a overall positive um, voltage on the outside of the axon and an overall negative voltage. The voltage that we have specifically is negative 70 millivolts um, within the axon. So when um, the membrane is depolarized, depolarized means basically that is, it is becoming more positive. The voltage will rise from negative 70 to about negative 50, negative 40, and that's just enough to break the threshold. The threshold here in this picture is about less than negative 50, which basically means that once it is broken through, we're going to send the action potential and it's going to um, rush sodium ions into the cell very rapidly. Here, the sodium ions are the, um, are the yellow guys. So when the action potential is starting, um, it'll depolarize, which means that the sodium ions will force themselves into the inside of the axon. And as a result, the neighboring part of the axon will see that there are sodium ions rushing in, which will trigger it to let that part of the axon let the uh, sodium ions rush in. So it's kind of like a domino effect. Once one domino falls, every single domino falls. And the same way in which a domino effect is a linear effect, um, it happens in the neuron as well. So if it starts here, essentially it will travel all the way down to the end, to the synaptic terminal, to either release a, an electrical impulse, which is the one that we originally started with, or a chemical impulse, which would be a um, neurotransmitter. Um, pretty much it. That's that's the basics of an action potential. Some things that you need to know: the resting potential is negative seventy millivolts. The threshold potential is a potential uh, in which you have to break through. So, once the sodium starts rushing in, it has to be enough sodium to raise um, the voltage to a more positive number. <clears throat> Excuse me. And once it does that, it will trigger the action potential. And the action potential will always be of the same magnitude. And what I mean by that, it will always be of the same value. So when we're triggering action potentials, our action potentials are not going to vary. They're not going to be 50, 54, 55. No, they're consistently going to be, let's say, if the number is 55, it will be consistently 55 throughout. No matter how. Um, strong or low the stimulus was, and we'll get into that, um, it'll always be of the same magnitude. <clears throat> and once the action potential has been um, conducted for that portion of the neuron, then the cells, the, the sodium, will then rush out of the cell because they're rushing in to depolarize, but to repolarize, they're rushing out and they're um, and as a result, the millivoltage of the cell will continuously drop, dropping below the resting potential, which is a little period that is called hyperpolarization. And once that is done, hyper because it's more than um, 
more more like hyper which just means more more than what we need once that's done they will ultimately level out again so a good way of um thinking of that is like a good analogy that just came to mind is maybe um somebody doing a cannonball at first the water is going to splash everywhere and there's going to be ripples and the and the water is going to basically um come out of the pool and as time passes on that energy will slowly decrease and decrease and you will have a very calm pool once more so essentially that's the same thing um Excuse the coughing, guys. My throat is very dry. Um, what is a threshold potential? A threshold potential, again, is a threshold is the potential in which we need to cross over to be able to initiate the actual potential. Okay, spatial and temporal summation. Let's get into that. So um, we have two types of summation, spatial and temporal. And ultimately, the difference between the two is that in spatial summation, you may have three neurons contributing to the action potential. And these neurons, maybe their action potentials um, were of a magnitude H1 of five, right? Or maybe they send out five impulses. Let's say, yeah, Let's, they send out here, sorry, four impulses per neuron. So four times three is 12. So we have 12 impulses. Um, the postsynaptic neuron, what's going to happen is that the thing that is going to happen, sorry, is that it's going to add those 12 impulses and fire 12 impulses at once instead of three, four times or four, three times. Does that make sense? Like it's adding summation basically means the adding of. So these neurons are going to fire four impulses and this postsynaptic neuron is going to take all those impulses together and fire 12 in one shot. That's what spatial summation is. Temporal summation is where maybe a couple, one or two neurons will fire 12 impulses from one shot and the postsynaptic neuron will receive it and fire those 12 impulses, which is what you see here. So the number doesn't change here, whereas the number here is added onto it, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so we have a, an all or nothing principle which basically means that no matter the strength of the stimulus, the magnitude of the action potential will always be consistent. So a good analogy that I um, did for one of your classmates was um, if she uh, trained her dog to let her know when um, he or she needed to go to the bathroom, she then reaches the threshold, which is the dog telling her that it needs to go to the bathroom. And every time she walks the dog, she walks it for a mile, no matter if, it, the dog went to the bathroom at the beginning of the walk, in the middle of the walk, or at the end of the walk. Every single time she goes out, she walks the dog for a mile. So it's the same idea. Whether the action potential is a strong one, like we, the one that we see here where there's 12 impulses from one single neuron, or maybe there are four impulses from three different neurons, the magnitude, um, once it passes that threshold, it would fire um, at the same strength every single time um okay so we're done with that one so the movement of ions um very quickly so the ions that help in the action potential are sodium and potassium sodium and potassium um they are moved through different channels the very first one is the sodium potassium pump which requires atp or energy to move for every three sodiums, two potassiums. For every three sodiums out of the cell, two potassiums go into the cell. The next one that we have is our leaky channels, which are basically like a leaky faucet. They continuously let uh, sodium or potassium in or out um, with no need of energy or regulation. Um, they're good to maintain homeostatic balance in the cell. Um, then we have our chemical bolted um, what are the um, chemical membrane channels, which basically mean that they only function for certain ions. So these channels are really cool because they're very um, specific. So if 
potassium tries to get into the sodium channel, it will not allow it. And if sodium tries to get into put to the, to the potassium channel, it will not allow it. Um, uh, voltage, uh, the same thing. If an ion that has a different voltage than one that it's supposed to let through uh, tries to go through, it will not allow it. Um, the chemical membrane channels, uh, mechanical, sorry, mechanical, basically, um, it's just the movement. So if they're open, then the then the potassium or the sodium can go in and it'll change. It'll do a conformational shift or change, which is what we call mechanical. And it'll um, move the sodium or the potassium in or out of the cell, depending on what they're doing. So uh, for this one specifically, sodium is going out and then potassium is coming in. <clears throat> um, yes. So where is the synaptic knob? Uh, the synaptic knob is at the very end of our neuron. Um, what is the function of vesicles? So the nucleus sends out a signal um, to create neurotransmitters. So once it does that, they're either manufactured in the rough ER or the smooth ER and get sent over to the Golgi where they are prepackaged. They get moved through the axon through this um, carrier protein called kinesin. And at the very end, they um, reach the synaptic terminal in which the vesicles, basically, as you can see here, merge to the, the, the plasma membrane of the synaptic knob and get released and release the neurotransmitter. Um, what happens in the synaptic knob? We release neurotransmitters. Most types of synapses in the nervous system <clears throat> Um, I think we Googled that one. I'm not sure. Uh, we can come back to that one really quick because we're running out of time. Name two types of synapses. Um, we have electrical and chemical, which is what I um, mentioned before. Uh, we have neurotransmitters. So depending on where it's synapsing, so for muscles, we have acetylcholine, um, the type of neurotransmitter um, that is released by the neuron. Um, so yeah, so then this is like a really cool picture of the synapse. So where are the neurotransmitters produced within the neuron? So they're produced um, right here in the, in the rough or smooth ER, depending whether they're hydrophobic, which means water uh, hating or water loving, it depends. Um, what is the main function of dopamine? This is the pleasure. It's the pleasure um, neurotransmitter. What's the main function of serotonin? It's the mood neurotransmitter and acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is used for excitatory um, functions. So for muscle contraction, which we went over last week, that's what acetylcholine is used for. Um, also, acetylcholine is a learning neurotransmitter. For those of you who didn't know, like me, I didn't know. <laughs> okay, what is a stretch reflex? Um, so we have uh, a stretch reflex right here. So, um, so we know how like the nerves run up and down the spinal cord, depending if it's the um, ascending or descending, and they send information from the outside to the brain or from the brain to the outside. Um, sometimes this is a very primal thing that we have integrated into our bodies. There is no need, there is no time to send that information back up to the brain to let the, the brain know that we are in danger. So a good test of the, the, the stretch reflex is when we're getting our reflexes tested at the doctor, where they hit um, our, the space below our, our kneecap with a little mallet. Um, that activates the muscle to contract. And the way that that works in terms of our nerves is that that information is sent from the sensory back to the spinal cord immediately bypasses um, having to go back up and uses a shortcut back to be uh, back to the motor neuron where it immediately um, affects the muscle and has a contract. So essentially, um, this is really cool. These are called reflex arcs. And again, these are very primal um, functions that we have built into us. So if we ever touch something that is really hot, immediately you have no time to think whether it's hot or not, but the fact that you felt pain for an instant second will cause you to move your hand away very rapidly. 
Um, so that's essentially that. That's the, the reflex arc. So testing our reflexes, how fast we can um, respond. Um, define reflex. So reflex is involuntary, predictable motor, motor response to a stimuli. Um, define tone, tension of muscle at rest, mobility, range of motion around your joints. So you have limited mobility of your hip joints, of your knee joints, of your elbow joints, of your um, shoulder joints. Um, because we can't like go in a full circle, we can only do 180 or we for our elbow, we can only extend to 180. We cannot do 360 because that would mean that we would have to break our um, electron fossa and the other one goes into it. I forgot the name of it. Okay. So describe what a positive feedback loop is. So to, in order to understand this one, we have to understand what a negative feedback loop is. And a great example is uh, air conditioning. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, but okay. So. Um, my air conditioning has a thermostat and that thermostat registers the temperature of the house. So if, for example, I set the thermostat at, at 75 degrees, I want it to be 75 degrees in my house, but it reads that the temperature currently in my house is 78 degrees. What it will do is send a signal to the air conditioner unit and it will tell it, hey, you need to turn on because it's too hot in here. And once it reaches 75, it reads that the internal temperature of the house is 75, and that coincides with the temperature that I want it to be at, then uh, the air conditioning will stop functioning. That's a negative feedback loop, because once it reaches its target, it stops. That's why it's called negative. Um, a positive feedback loop um, would be where the thermostat is broken. So again, so the house is reading at 78, I want it to be 75, the air conditioning turns on, but once it reaches 75, it continues, it does not stop. It continuously lowers and lowers and lowers, even though um, I want it at 75, now the internal temperature is reading 72, 70, uh, I have a broken air conditioner, I have to call a repair guy. That would be a positive feedback loop, um, because once it starts, it doesn't stop. Um, in anatomy, what we, a good example that we have, it's very rare, but there are a couple, um, um, oxytocin is released for when uh, women are going into labor. And so once oxytocin is released, that stimulates contraction. And once it starts, it does not stop. So the more oxytocin gets released, the more contractions you have, the more contractions you have aiding in the releasing or the birthing of the child. Um, and that doesn't stop until um, there is a signal that there is nothing else left to contract to essentially there is another mechanism there that works that is that would be a negative feedback mechanism but for the beginning part of it that's a po positive feedback mechanism because once oxytocin is released it stimulates contractions and those contractions stimulate the release of more oxytocin which stimulate the release of more um which stimulate uh more contractions um so what are effectors essentially the muscles that end up uh, responding to the uh, to the signal being put out by the motor or uh, sensory neuron. <clears throat> okay, so uh, neuropathies, neuropathology, sorry. Um, so what is an upper motor uh, lesion? Basically a lesion that will affect um, the information being sent up to the to the brain. Um, so you cut the nerve that is communicating between the brain and the spinal cord. What is a lower motor neuron uh, motor neuron lesion? I guess you can say it's um, a lesion where it affects the nerve fibers traveling from the anterior horn of the spinal cord to the associated muscles. So basically, it's where you're affecting the ascending sorry the descending tracks. So you're cutting um, the nerve that is helping out, um, helping contract, let's say your biceps, um, brachii. You cut that, you can't, and because the connection is lost. So this, the, the signal is still being sent, but it's not being received by the muscle because the bridge between the two has been cut. Um, what is an epidural block? Um, basically, this is an epidural. 
uh, women sometimes choose to receive an epidural block uh, for when they're giving uh, birth. Um, so they put it in between L3 and L4, the needle with the anesthetic. And here are the, there are two. There is an epidural block and there's a subdural block. So as you can see here, an epidural block basically um, injects the anesthetic to the upper part of the dura matter. So that's why it's called epidural because it doesn't reach um, the lower part of it. Whereas a subdural uh, releases the anesthetic to the bottom part or inferior part of the dura matter, as you can see here. So epidural above the dura, subdural below the dura. That's the difference between the two. A uh, spinal tap, otherwise known as a lumbar puncture, is um, usually done between L4 and L5. And basically what that is, is that they're taking a sample of your cerebrospinal fluid for testing to see if you have any conditions or maybe you have meningitis, that'd be a good way to test. If there's an infection of the meninges. Um, and yeah, it's a really long needle. And, you know, people are cautious because this is where a lot of nerves that innervate your your limbs come are are part of or are in, so they are very cash, cautious with this. Um, meningitis is an infection of the meninges. So here are your meninges where where they're healthy, they're happy. You know the cerebrospinal fluid is like clear, it's looking good. Um, if there is an infection, you have a swollen tissue because of the inflammatory response of our immune system that gets triggered. Um, the cerebral spinal fluid gets infected because there's probably like pathogens in it, like free floating bacteria. Um, so it's not a good time. Um, bacterial meningitis is worse than viral meningitis, if I'm not mistaken. They're both really bad, but one is a little bit worse than the other. What is Wallerian degeneration? Basically, it's the degeneration that results when a nerve fiber is cut or crushed. And the part of the axon and the part of the axon distal to the injury degenerates. So part of the axon that is distal to the injury degenerates. So the part of the axon that has lost essentially all communication with the cell body is the one that dies, essentially. As you can see here, um, this happens uh, when um, people get into crashes or really traumatic accidents that end up um, Paralyzed um, is a possibility. I'm not too sure. I'm not too um, versed on what exactly happens uh, to become paralyzed, but I know that it has to do with um, the lack of signal being trans transduced to the muscles. Um, and lastly, what is poliomyelitis? Poliomyelitis is basically the destruction of the ventral horn motor neurons by poliovirus which is something that can be contracted from the outside. Lucky for us, we have eliminated or if not eradicated, sorry, not eradicated, but have developed vaccines against polio, which we are all vaccinated for from a very young age, from when we were first born. Um, but back then in the, I think it was like the 20s or 40s or 50s, I'm not sure. I know that um, one of the president's FDR um, had polio, and I think that's why he ended up in, wheelchair, in a wheelchair. Um, but you may have to check me on that one because it might not have been FDR, I'm not sure. Um, it leads to muscle atrophy and essentially what it does is that it um, destroys the nerves that allow for voluntary muscle control, but it also ends up over a long period of time destroying the nerves that um, allow for involuntary muscle control, so like respiration and heartbeat. People that have survived polio for an extended period of time, they uh, basically see a degeneration of, of every, of, in, in every way of that word. Um, I know that there, uh, they, people back, back in the days created these, like, pressure chambers, where they created this negative and positive pressure chamber to aid the person whose um, nerves were failing them to breathe. So that person would be stuck in the chamber and the negative and positive pressure would allow them to um, contract and expand their lungs. And they're basically stuck in there for the, 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 
the end of their life, essentially. Polio is not a, not a pretty disease. Okay, and we're done. Oh, that was fun. And with three minutes to spare. So talk to me, guys. Questions, comments, concerns? What are you feeling? I have a question. Um, there is a, a question in the review that says the arms law. Yes. And I know what it is, but I don't know how it's related to the to the nervous system and uh, all this stuff. Okay, yeah, sure. So we can go back into that one. Yes. So Ohm's law. That's yes. a really good question. Okay, so let's go back up here. Um, Ohm's law essentially is um, saying that the change in voltage is dependent on the current and the resistance, right? Uh huh. So essentially, what that ultimately translates to is the less resistance you have, um, the less change in voltage you will have, which means that your magnitude or the amount of energy that you're propagating through your neuron, through your axon, will not change. Does that make sense? Okay. So yeah, so like, because we have myelination, what it does is that it creates less amounts of resistance and as a result, the initial <clears throat> voltage that you have here um, is much less than, is sorry, is the same at the end than if you didn't have myelination. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, does anybody else have a question? everything good okay jose um okay guys so if you don't have any questions um and for things that i may have accidentally skipped over this um recording was for the 9 a.m and the 10 a.m class so you can go back and rewatch the the morning session of it basically it's all the same thing but the more the merrier i guess um ideally you guys will take the exam on friday of this week um if not at your earliest convenience, um, we basically have this um, this time frame so that you guys don't get like swamped with course uh, work because it's a lot of stuff and we are nearing the end of the semester and he wants to make sure that he covers everything you guys before you pass on to anatomy too, which is very important because all we do is build up from there. So, so if you guys are good, no more questions, then you're all free to go and enjoy your day. Have a great day, guys.